Hello everyone, my name is Eduardo Silva and welcome to this session called High Throughput Plus Low Resource Usage and Login Journey. As you can see, my email is uh, it's on the first slide, so feel free to reach out anytime for questions or any kind of follow-up that you wanted to do. As I say, my name is Eduardo. I'm mostly on Twitter and GitHub under my nick is Deeper. I'm the founder of Calithia, which is a company which provides full support and products on top of the FluentD and FluentBit ecosystem. Feel free to reach out through the website too. I'm also the creator and maintainer of FluentBit project, which is part of the CNCF and FluentD sub project. So in general, everybody wants performance, right? If you want to achieve high throughput, the you think about performance, but everything has a, a little cost, right? So, and when people say performance, eh, sometimes think about what's my, the number of records or events that I can process by a unit of time, right? And after that, you start realizing that maybe the setup that you have or the strategy that your tool is using might not be conformant or maybe it's not following the best practices from a configuration perspective. Uh, if you think about, uh, I want to consume low CPU or I don't want to exceed this amount of memory. And that is, it's really hard to come up with a, with an ideal solution. But I can talk about how do we solve this problem in, in FluentBed and where are we going with this? So our journey started uh, years ago. We had this project called uh, FluentD. And FluentD is really good for service. It's really good to aggregate information. We have a huge ecosystem, right? Where with people and companies has contributed more than a thousand of plugins. And it's really great. So I'm, I'm saying this because I'm, maybe I would say that 80% of you maybe is familiar with FluentD, which is a graduated CNCF project. But also here we're going, we're going to explain and talk about the journey of the sub project of it, which is part of the ecosystem. And when talking about login, uh, there's a, a couple of things that we need to clarify, right? Login by itself is not cheap. And we need to understand that logging in the past used to be pretty simple, right? An application just ship a message. This message, message got stored in the file system, or maybe it uses syslog or syslog or any or system B or any kind of service to handle the message for it, right? And most of these messages are text-based. But if you think about what is the end of this message, is that it allows you to perform some data analysis. And to do that, you need to take all these messages and centralize them in a database. So then you can create some kind of schema or run some queries on top of it. It doesn't matter if you store in a SQL or non-SQL kind of database or document oriented. Actually, the pattern is pretty much the same. You want to have some structure, which is on top of the text message that was generated at the beginning. And one of the challenges, if you think about throughput performance, is that every time we have more data because we have more applications, right? Everybody is now deploying microservices, decoupling everything. And it's really hard to keep control of what's the logging rate of each application or what kind of messages this is sending, right? Sometimes you don't want to just care about specific messages like info warning errors, but maybe you don't want to debug messages. Maybe you can raise your hand if you have been managing some system where a developer by mistake just enabled the debug mode, the debug mode for one application. And you start to see all this increase of load of log, of log messages in your pipeline, which is quite normal. But that affects performance, right? Because that is our goal. And as I said later, so if we think about the workflow of how this works together, is that we have this application that generates, generates a simple log message and sometimes multiple of them. As an example, let's take this simple message that it comes from an Nginx, an Nginx log, access log. Actually, what it's doing is just writing a message which specifies the IP address, a timestamp on when this uh, request was generated, plus the information from the protocol, the method, the URI, the protocol version, the response site from the server, blah, blah, blah. But this log message, also it's not unique, right? It could be different. Sometimes applications generate messages in, in different formats, even coming from the same application. Sometimes you have multi-line application or think about stack traces, right? 
So you can think that this thing is a bit complex. And when you have this application generating this message, I would say that 80% of the time is just a raw text message. It doesn't have any structure, it doesn't have any schema. Nowadays, we are seeing people and companies trying to accomplish, let's try to log with JSON or trying to unify a specific format. But in reality, that, that effort has been around for years. And it is really hard to say that the industry is going to align to one specific format. It's really hard. It doesn't happen in the last 20 years, right? But I would say that uh, nowadays, because of parsing um, capabilities, maybe JSON is like the middle point between uh, all the options uh, available. I'm not saying that it's best. It's really slow. But at least it's something that uh, we can start with. Right? And when they will generate this message, this message get to this being handled by syslog or syslog or systemd, any kind of services running in the, in the system. And now we can have many of them. But also if we think how this works, because our goal is to perform data analysis, is that we have all these files with all these records, maybe from different applications, maybe from the same one. So we need to have this kind of engine that is able to listen for these messages or realize that they are there and then be able to take them and send it out to any destination like Amazon S3, Elastic, Stackdriver, Splunk, or any kind of service, right? Nowadays, we have multiple options in the market. And this is just an example of one of them. There's no preference from, from my perspective. Actually, every user might choose their own vendor or vendors for each one. And in the engine side, uh, there's a couple of steps. It's not just take the data in and send the data out. If you think about throughput, Right, uh, that is quite easy and that is quite, quite fast, right? There's no so much muscle work on that. Take the data in, send the data out. But actually a real log processing, log processor needs to come deal with different kinds of things. Like for example, collect the log, logs that come from different sources, not just a file, maybe from system D, from TCP, UDP. Take this data, apply, or optionally try to apply some parsing so to convert it on a structure method to a structure, maybe to JSON or to maybe some binary format that we can deal with internally. And sometimes most of these messages also need to have some metadata on it. If you are receiving some messages over TCP, likely you would like to add the IP address from the, where this message is coming from. Now, if you are wearing KubeCon, right? So if you think about messages coming from your pod, you would like to have your labels inside the same record. So then you can group them and perform your query without any problems, without losing context. But also there are other cases where you want to perform some data reduction, right? If you're dropping a lot of messages and these messages has like, a, as I said earlier, information debug messages, debug maybe you don't want them, right? So you want to make sure that every everything that comes as a debug message in your pipeline, just drop it, right? If you think about a storage that charge you the bill, right? Because of the amount of data that you ingest, right? You're maybe interested in to perform data reduction and not send the whole information. Also as part of the role of the log processor is to perform buffering. And buffering is the capability to take this data and optionally maybe store it persist in a persistent way on this because you need to restart the service or maybe the service just crash or you have get a hardware failure or network audit. So you want to make sure that you don't lose any data. And finally, be able to send this information to uh, different destinations. And these destinations are important. Uh, some of them are just to handle the information as a binary blobs, right? Because I just want to store the information that I'm getting. But for example, in the case of Elastic, you just care about how you can query my documents. Ideally, I want to have all my documents in Elastic with a good structure in the JSON map so I can query or have kind of index through them, right? Same thing happened with Stackdriver and same thing happens with uh, Splunk plus others. In general, you can think that we have an input with different sources, we have this engine in the middle and we have the output. So explaining these concepts are, is, is really important to understand performance. 
right? Because we need to realize what, how this works behind the scenes, right? So in general, simplifying everything is an input and an output. But we need to explain what is happening inside the input. For example, inside the input, you have a lot of I.O. I.O. means maybe you are opening a file from, from the disk, right? Or maybe you are listening from a new uh, network connection, or maybe you are collecting metrics locally from the proc file system, or just receiving them from a third-party service. In the engine, has a lot of work, as we explained it earlier. It's like you have to parse information, you have to offer options to filter this data, like enrich it or discard data, also to serialize this information. Because if you get the data as raw data or binary data, and you're going to do all this parsing, this filtering, you need to have a unified model for your data, right? And having a binary format is ideal to do any kind of data processing. This buffering to store the data so you don't lose it, and be able to have a routing logic to decide how to send my information that is coming from a specific source to a different destination based in a pattern, how to schedule retries and so on. And in the output side means that how do I send this information that I just got in my engine to a third party service? It's like I need to deal with network setup with payload formatting because every output destination expects a different payload format. Most of them are working with JSON nowadays, but for example, difference is Kafka, right? Kafka it has in its own format for the network, but all of the others, Elastic, uh, Azure Log Analytics, uh, even Splunk use JSON, right? And the output side needs to deal with delivering content in different formats, or also be able to understand if I'm sending this information, I'm, I need to expect for, for a specific return code because if something failure and the server maybe says, you know what, I could not process this information, we need to retry. The engine needs to be able to retry through a scheduler. So something that started as an input and output has a lot of tasks in, that works internally. And now I'm going to introduce Fluentbit. Uh, I know that we just talked about it, talking about FluentD, and I'm sure that you are really familiar with this. Actually, FluentD and FluentBit are from the same family, from the CNCF, and FluentBit is a CNCF sub-project under the umbrella of um, FluentD. And the, the good thing about FluentBit is that it was always designed to have higher performance than FluentD. FluentD is great, but also is written in Ruby. And being written in Ruby has some downsides from a scripting language, right? It's really easy to, to extend, it's really easy to scale, but if you want to optimize on resources, it's, it's really hard. And I would say that it's not just Ruby, but any kind of language that start implementing a system level application that start coupling a bunch of dependencies, right? Actually, you start focusing mostly on usability or how to extend it, that optimizing every single component for performance. A fluent bit is written in C language, and we try to reduce as much as possible the dependencies and try to build our own architecture and deal with most of the stuff uh, on our own. And I think that uh, from a community perspective, we have to get a really good feedback and really good traction uh, from this. Nowadays, the users use FluentD, majority of them, while others are using FluentBed, and we have a third option, which both are using, but well, they are using both. They are using FluentBed and they are using FluentD uh, together. So let's talk more uh, about the pipeline internals. We call a pipeline to everything that where it flows data, right? We're talking about logging, we're talking about technology, right? We're talking that kind of pipes. So understanding how the data flows is really interesting. Now, if we talk about system code, if we analyze in general, all the input interfaces to collect data from IO, these metrics or so on, you ended up using system calls like open, read, socket, list, and bind, and well, the functions to perform a memory allocation and memory management in general. This is pretty fine. This is not a, a big problem. I would say that the most critical part is how do you manage the memory while consuming data, while processing the data, and while sending this information uh, out. As part of the 
engine, we can call it like a processor. Here we're split, splitting the explanation in two parts. Actually, the engine needs to be able to do parsing, right? Because we mentioned that we want to have this unstructured information to a structured format, right? So we take it, could take a JSON, parse a JSON, or apply a regular expression on top of this set data, because my data is quite custom, but I know how to group them, right? As the Nginx example, we know that the first field is an IP address, the second one is a timestamp, and so on, or log formats for kind of uh, Golang messages, CSV, etc. Also, as part of filtering, you might want to do some kind of data enrichment. In Kubernetes, of course, you want to append all your labels or sometimes your annotations to every single log record. But also, you want to do some kind of data exclusion based on some patterns. And internally, uh, I would say in our case, we serialize all our information, every single event, doesn't matter if it's a metric or a log record, we use message pack, which is a kind of a similar to a JSON binary, but quite more performant. And for buffering mechanism, we offer memory and disk, which we are going to explain in a few minutes. Also as part of this processing um, work, we need to be able to route this data, right? We have a logic to route this data, meaning like for every data that comes from a different, from a specific source, you want to send it, one example, Elasticsearch. But also you want to archive all the information to Amazon S3. Yeah, this is quite a common example. And we have found some cases also that uh, enterprise companies are using Splunk heavily, and they are deciding to just send to Splunk, not 100% of the data, but maybe 50%, right? Which is more critical information that you're going to run queries over it, and all of the other two archive systems, right? And also as part of this processing engine, we have all this scheduling, we have our own schedule, because if you're collecting data, you need to have a lot of timers to say when to collect data from which place and which kind of collector but also have this logic that if some OPPO destination failed and ask it to retry something, be able to handle that task and implement a retry in place. As part of the output side of this pipeline, we, we mentioned that everything is about also network setup. So we need to perform DNS lookup, connect to an endpoint, and you want to implement, of course, nowadays um, TLS. So actually, as part of that process, you want to handle the TLS handshake, and ideally, you want to can maintain this uh, connection alive with Keep Alive, right? If you are uh, closing a connection and open a new connection every single time, that will be really expensive because the TLS handshake process is really expensive because of the round trips. We mentioned that also internally, we have all this data in binary format. Right? And this binary format for us is message pack. But when you are talking to Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch does not understand message pack. It understands JSON maps or, well, or any kind of JSON object. So what you have to do, or what we do in our Elasticsearch connector is take this message pack binary message and then send, convert it back to JSON and then send it over the network, right? So we need to do the payload delivery, write all the data, make sure that all data was delivered, check for return status and report to the engine what was the final uh, status of about all these processing. So now about optimizing uh, all this data process and IO in general, it's really interesting to understand uh, how things uh, works you know, and at the deep level. So as I said, for to manage messages internally, we use a binary representation of the data using message pack. And also when dealing with how to handle this information when it's serialized internally at runtime, we have a, a really good uh, implementation with buffer management with an hybrid mechanism with memory and a file system. We group all the records in chunks, and this is something I'm going to explain in, a, in the next slide. About data serialization and message pack, here in the screen we have a table which compares what, how many bytes compares using JSON 
versus message back, right? For example, for a null, message null in JSON is, means four bytes, in message back is just one. If we go to a more critical example with a map, which is in the last line, right, with a key called 40 and with a value null, actually it used 11 bytes. In message back, that is five bytes. This is just a comparison of how one format works against the other, right? Of course, message pack is quite small than a JSON payload, right? But I would say that this is one of the advantage. But the other advantage is that in message pack, you don't need to parse every single byte per byte, right? In JSON, you have to do it. You have to create some kind of index across all your map and then you know you can know where the data start and where the data begins and ends. In message pack, you can know that you have an array beforehand with X number of items. So you can jump between them. So when you are dealing with data processing, when you are removing some message, uh, sorry, so key or adding more key or doing some kind of any kind of modification is quite more performant and easy to do it. Internally, when we get this data, we talk about data serialization. Now imagine that we got a text message as a JSON map. What we do is convert this JSON to message pack. And then we have this notion of tag. A tag is just like a label. So for every information that comes from a specific source that has the same time, the same tag, they are all grouped together under the same chunk, right? And a chunk is just and amount of bytes that store many records, right? Usually we handle chunks around two megabytes, which is a, has been really efficient for most of the use cases. And so consider the chunk, which is a more critical unit of data, granular data that we have in the Fluent Bed pipeline. Now, how this operates, for example, in memory. When the engine starts getting data, what we do is to create just one chunk in memory, right? And what we do is start appending the events, right, on that chunk until that chunk gets to two megabytes. And then we simply create, if we get more information, we just get a new chunk and we do the same procedure. It doesn't matter if we have the same tag or not, we, we just create blocks of chunks uh, in memory. Until one point we have a bunch of uh, chunks uh, linked in memory, which is pretty efficient, is pretty fast. Actually, memory buffering is the fastest uh, implementation. But there's one downside, right? It's not persistent. It's not persistent. So what would happen if our service is restarted? What would happen if the service crashes? Yeah, you're going to lose that data. And also, there's one more critical part. If you're running in containers, likely your container will have a limit about how much memory that process, in this case, Fluent Bit, can consume. And if you go on over that, right, well, you will not, you reach the limit, the kernel is going to kill your, your pod or your container. So there's a kind of a special situations where you just want to run in memory, right? But I would say 90% of the time, you want to use a secondary a option which, so a secondary, a, sec, a secondary option with, which is a file system. In the opposite, it's what it does in the file system, it, this even is a not storing the things in memory means that we're going to start, start storing the things in the file system, right? So it's, but this is, of course, is most intensive on IO. But here we have a couple, couple of optimizations on how do we find the chunks on how do we store them. Right? So every time that we get more information, we are getting a new chunk and just appending this information to the chunk. And to what point that we have many chunks uh, in the file system. But there's a curious thing here. Uh, here, this is a couple of a simple example where we have five files, right? Five chunks. But if you think about that, we have 2,000, 3,000, because maybe you were not able to send the data because the destination is down. Right? You will see, A, hey, uh, but I'm going to have all these chunks open. I'm going to use a, a single file descriptor for each one. And I would say that now uh, we are going to talk most about a uh, database's concept, right? We don't use any external database. 
right? We implemented our own layer to for this specific use case. Actually, we think that uh, databases are really good and better proof, but they are for generic purposes, right? Here we are dealing with this kind of uh, log information that we need to group them in a different way, and we need to deal with file system, memory, but based on our pipeline logic and not a generic database logic. I'm not saying that databases are bad. I'm saying that for our purposes and performance gains, uh, our solution, this solution that we implemented works quite good. And now we're going to jump into a more elaborate complex. And, and this is what people really use in production. Actually, it's not just a memory or file system. What we have is like an hybrid mechanism where all the data that we are creating, of course, goes to memory. But in the pipeline, we say for this input source of data, for example, you are turning log files or listening for messages, you can say just uh, keep up in memory. We have the concept of up and down. You can see in the screen that we have some different colors in gray for down and a, a light green for up. Means that everything that is up in memory is ready to be used, or maybe it's a chunk that you can append more data, right? But we protect the memory saying that, hey, you can have in memory up to, for example, a hundred of chunks, right? And if each chunk is, is two megabytes, well, you can make you can make the math your own, right? But after that, we start storing all the chunks in the file system. But how do we correlate this between all the chunks that are in memory plus file system? Actually, what we do is to use a memory mapped files, which is a really common um, implementation for databases where we map a file that exists in the file system as if it were in memory. And actually that is really, really performant, right? We are not using common system calls like read and write because we try to avoid the, the context copy of the data between the kernel and user space. So using memory mapped files is quite fast and we can have the control of how the data flows and if we get ingested, for example, imagine that uh, the, the output side is down and we're getting more data in, you are going to face this concept of back pressure, right? If you don't have a half file system, you're going to store all your data in memory and at some point your process is going to crash. But what we do is store in memory as much as we can based on our own configuration limits. And after that, continue writing to file list. Now, if you look at the image, you will see that in the file system part or on the disk, you will see that some blocks are gray and others are light green. On this case, on gray, we are saying that these chunks are not up in memory. They are just in the file system. And when the memory part get empty, not get empty, but start delivering the chunks, we get more room, more space to work on the pipeline. We just take the chunks and load them up in memory. And this has been implemented for almost two years and to be in a very scalable design where we can handle, I don't know, 200K messages per second without any problem, but you can increase that based on configuration and your own. There are many variables in your environment. And then one thing about this, all this data processing, for example, with binary representation, we can get the CPU and the CPU consumption low, right? Also, all this IO to this, all this hand of memory is quite more performant and it's a really scalable design. Right now, uh, this is better proof. Uh, this is uh, Fluent Bit. It's quite used heavily on most of major cloud providers like Google, AWS, Microsoft, Azure. And as a team, we have this kind of uh, companies that work together. Actually, we have weekly meetings with most of them where they contribute also to the project. They are part of Fluent Bed and they're trying to improve the whole uh, Fluent uh, ecosystem. Nowadays, uh, this is scalable design, uh, I would say that is most uh, scalable and cheap implementation in the market right now. You might find another solutions, um, but you will find that one thing is data rate and the other is data consumption, right? So if you want to send the data fast enough, yeah, just support the file disk, right? If you want to, if you want to always 
have a low CPU, a low memory consumption, maybe you can slow down the ingestion, do some throttling. Also, um, one good thing to mention for everybody is like, don't trust what I'm saying. I would say that in general, when running these kind of things, uh, you should run your own benchmark. And don't trust in benchmarks that are published on websites, right? Neither trust in our own benchmarks. You might, every project has, must have their own baseline, but we encourage every single user to run your own benchmark because every single configuration is different. Every use case is different. Now, as the next part, we're going to do a quick demo on how Fluentbit operates. And due to time, we are going to just explain a little bit of the configuration, uh, how do we achieve to send in just something conservative numbers like at 100,000 records per second, which is most suitable for all cases. Um, actually, that configuration is using file system buffering, right, together with this hybrid mechanism. So I'm going to switch back to the terminal. Now in my left pane here, I have the my Fluentbit configuration. This is a bare metal server on a different place. And what we're going to do is basically just tell one log file and send the data in JSON format to a remote HTTP endpoint, right? The remote HTTP endpoint is here on the right. And this is just a basic a TLS with HTTP server that is able to understand the JSON records and also expose a Prometheus metrics. Okay, e and on the, this third one, I'm going to run the load generator, which is a script that will generate around a thousand lines uh, per second, right? Each one will have one kilobyte. Okay, so to get started, I'm going to run flu embed and now the configuration file. But let me check that I did a, a full cleanup of everything. Okay. We are good to go. Now I'm going to start Prometheus because we are interested in to collect the metrics and run the HTTP server. And as soon as I start the load generator here, we are going to see that the data, the count of records will start increasing on the right. So let's start. You will see also that in the Fluent Bit pane right here, we are seeing a bunch of A's status messages that the data was processed. And now also you can realize on the right that the number of records keep increasing and actually it's increasing quite constantly for 100,000 records. So let's verify how everything is working on the Prometheus side. So I'm going to my web browser and start typing the address of Prometheus endpoint. Okay, I'm here. I'm going to write my PromQL query, which will be fluent underscore records total. I'm going to use a five minutes. And we're going to graph this information. We're going to get down so we can just get the new data that we're getting now, or just the latest minute. Okay, so this is the information that we are processing at the moment. Actually, it's quite constant. This was the start of the process. If we continue running the query, we will see that we are constantly around 100,000 messages per second. Usually on this scenario, uh, we don't see any back pressure. We don't see any problems. We will might see sometimes that the data goes down for a few seconds, but could be because of networking, but then usually it recovers uh, without problem. Okay, in the normal scenario, like in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, the data rate, data rate will be different. Actually, you might expect to have, a, I don't know, a couple of nodes sending data to your own database, right? It could be Elastic, Splunk, but uh, there's no like generic setup for each one to achieve a perfect rate. Actually, it's quite complex to determine uh, what would be the, the ideal requirements from a hardware perspective. But we can see that with this way, we can uh, process the data without any major problem. Okay, so we're going to get back here to the terminal and we see that everything keeps running without any major problem. Okay, so I think that we are good to go with this. 
And I think that now it's time for some Q&A, some questions. So uh, please feel free to write your questions right now in the chat or live during this session. Thank you so much.